That's great. Good afternoon. If folks can take their seat, we will get started. Well, thanks, everybody, uh, for coming um, to a continuation of this six-part series. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, NHGRI, and in particular our History of Genomics program, is sponsoring um, a lecture series uh, commemorating the 25th anniversary of the launch of the Human Genome Project. Um, the schedule for that is shown here, and we are here. And after today, we'll be at the halfway point. Um, and so far, it's been just wonderful with our first two uh, um, uh, sessions, and, and today will be no different, and we look forward to the final three that will be in March, April, and May. Uh, but today, the focus is on our guest all the way from the UK, uh, Ewan Burney. So let me start with some uh, biographical details of our good friend and colleague. Ewan um, did his undergraduate training at Oxford University uh, when he was an undergraduate, mostly focusing on biochemistry. But his uh, transition to bioinformatics uh, was swift once he got to graduate school, um, where, and he, where he did graduate studies at Cambridge University, uh, earning a PhD while working under the mentorship of Dr. Richard Durbin at the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute. Then his transition from being a graduate student to essentially being in the limelight of the Human Genome Project in the field of genomics was a very rapid one, and this will actually be, uh, I anticipate, part of what Ewan talks about in his seminar. Um, but needless to say, uh, Ewan, and the reason we asked him to come speak today, truly represents one of those superstar researchers whose career uh, was launched by the Human Genome Project. Uh, Ewan's many accomplishments um, include being one of the founders of the Ensemble Genome Browser and other databases, playing a key role in many large-scale genomics projects, such as the Human Genome Project, but also NHGRI's ENCODE project, and, uh, and a number of other important projects he's been involved with, but also playing a critical role in annotation of genome sequences that have been generated for organisms like human and mouse and chicken and several others. Meanwhile, he has a vibrant research program of his own um, that focuses on genomic algorithms and inter individual differences in human and other species. But the other distinguishing thing to talk about with Ewan is his leadership. He is a natural leader. Um, he has assumed various uh, leadership roles in his uh, still very uh, early career um, uh, because of his youth. Um, but what's in particularly remarkable is already uh, his, is his most recent appointment as a position of associate director um, of EMBL European Bioinformatics Institute, where he shares strategic um, oversight of EBI services with his colleague, uh, Rolf Alpweiler. Um, and EMBL EBI hosts some of the world's most important collections of biological data, as I'm sure you know. The other reason we invited you in to come here uh, today um, is, and, and participate in this is that he's just such a great friend and a colleague um, of NHGRI and has been for so many years, and actually also to NIH. It just, if I sort of started thinking back on the number of times we've asked you in to come join us at a workshop, to come lead a working group, to come serve on a study section, to come advise us about this, that, and other, in addition to being a grantee uh, many times, uh, it just, I would, I would run out of fingers, actually, pretty quickly. He's just always there to help us out, including just jumping on phone calls with us when asked. So he really is uh, really part of our, our extended uh, family um, and really one of the people that does a lot of important service work for us. So that's why he's here today, and that's his biographical um, information. But I also wanted to share with you just some fun aspects of Ewan. Um, and remember, this is all, this whole series is about being um, part of the historical um, uh, program of genomics at NHGRI. So, you know, we have historians, we keep track of things um, um, at the Institute now, and we're also really good at doing research about it. And so Ewan's going to uh, be here and, uh, and specifically tell us some things that are connecting him to the Human Genome Project and so forth. But, but, you know, there is some history here that's worth sharing and also even some recent history. So, so first of all, I, I dug out, uh, you know, from our archives, you know, old photos in particular, and then found some on the web I want to share with you. It really gives you a little bit of insights into Ewan. Uh, this picture, actually, I had in my archives, this is right when he was about to get famous, because this is just coming out of the Human Genome Project, um, and the group that was instrumentally important in helping to stitch together the human genome sequence, which I'm sure he's going to talk about. But Ewan, even back then, was uh, sought after for stories 
um, and he certainly was one to get a lot of headlines uh, written about him. Um, here was one talking about the genomics big talker. Um, here's the one talking about bring me your genomes. And uh, so, you know, the press covers him. Um, as I've said, he's come and done many things with us. Um, um, and sometimes when we've hosted him here for some major workshops and data jamborees and so, and so forth, uh, you know, it's been fun to go watch you and blow off some steam. So a number of years ago as part of one of our workshops, uh, this is you and a Dave and Busters. He probably doesn't even remember this. You do remember this. Um, well, that's good because uh, I wasn't sure how many beers you had that night. Um, but uh, needless to say, uh, he, he got into wanting to test every possible game that was at Dave and Buster's. Um, and uh, even wearing his famous geek t-shirt, which he was, he, he's very quick to tell everybody that he's just one of another a number of geeks. Um, so that's fun loving you. And the other thing I really like about you, and he reminds me of me, is that um, <laughs> You, you just can't talk without your hands, at least, and you and I share that in common. And boy, you go on the web and look for you in pictures, and boy, does it show that he is just like me. He cannot talk without using his hands, and uh, it just plays out over and over again. So I, I really identify <laughs> with him uh, a lot. The other thing, though, I had an I, I mean, Ewan is a very fun, great sense of humor, jovial person. I was shocked that there actually are imitating a thug photos of you and out there. I had no idea he ever looked that serious or mean, but apparently uh, cameras don't lie. So for some reason, he can sort of be a little bit intimidating, if you will. But I was even more shocked because I've seen you in dozens, if not hundreds of times. I have never seen him making a fashion statement, but apparently somebody got him to make a fashion statement. I barely recognized him with a tie, so. But most seriously, when I was doing my research, to me, this was the prototypic picture because I think of Ewan as a prototypic thought leader and of a programmatic leader, and here he is with, I know, two of his very good colleagues uh, that he works closely with and has, uh, Janet Thornton and Rolf Oppweiler, and um, I just thought this sort of typified uh, what I think of Ewan um, as, as a leader and as someone as a great colleague. So with that in mind, I will turn this over. This is the title we thought he was going to use, but um, the power of PowerPoint is that you can quickly change titles on the fly. And from what I understand, I think uh, Ewan actually did that in his talk. So I will turn this over to Ewan now. Thank you. Great. Um, I'm going to be very self-conscious now about my hands. No, it's, no, going, no. it's going to be tough. Uh, I've also got this kind of laser beam. Um, so uh, we're bringing NHGRI into the 21st century, and uh, just a moment ago, we decided on the hashtag for this talk series as well. So uh, uh, we now have a hashtag. Um, uh, so do um, tweet um, if you want to as well. Now, Eric gave me a brief. He said, Ewan, I don't, don't come with your normal talk, uh, was the brief. I kind of want history and personal stuff and all of that. And that made me really um, think. Uh, so the slides actually aren't quite as polished, perhaps, as I would like them to be. But they are very much for this audience. Uh, so we'll go through them. And you'll see there's a theme. So I, I also decided to do uh, my life a little bit in pictures. Uh, so this is me not quite uh, at the start at 1996, but all the way uh, 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 to me now in that uh, picture with the tie. One picture, <laughs> <laughs> One picture with the tie, yeah. Um, and there's sort of three layers, I think, to my scientific career. And interesting enough that it doesn't start with genomes. It starts with data resources. It starts with delivering things to people through bioinformatics services. And that's probably the strongest theme uh, to my life. Um, ending up now, um, I'm director of the Embol, <laughs> not associate director, um, of uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, uh, uh, leading to, to um, looking after strategically um, EBI. And I'll come back to this uh, later on in the talk. But the other part of my life is writing methods and algorithms to analyze these data sets. And that's an interesting world. I'm not actually a computer scientist or a statistician. Some people think I am. Um, I'm a biochemist who taught myself to how to program and then taught myself enough statistics to fake it uh, in front of some mainly biologists, but the occasional statistician. 
Um, and these different methods are methods, some of the methods that I've produced, um, usually with just one or two other people. But then, as Eric mentioned, I have been right in the engine room of a number of these projects. And I, I was, um, it was very, very young when I was involved in the Human Genome Project. It absolutely accelerated my career. I basically missed a postdoc or a long postdoc. I went straight from being a student to a PI. But all of these projects, and there are many more I could put up here, uh, have had that same feature of doing huge amounts of analysis. Uh, really, again, for me, actually not for your nature papers, but to go back to these, to delivering data sets that other people use. So the rationale for me getting into the, involved in the Genome Project is not really my name is on papers. It's so that the stuff that I have made gets used by uh, researchers uh, around the world. And I did a little bit of kind of, I mean, this was a bit shocking to me. How do, who is this amazing person? Uh, so <laughs> how did I have the time to do this? I've published over 210 papers. I have an H index of 92. 15 papers, I've got over 1,000 citations. Um, I've got 30 pieces of software, which I can find on my hard drive that I have released to the world. Um, a whole bunch of those uh, are still in use today, chunking away uh, in the middle of things. I've founded and, and made happen a couple of widely used data resources, and I've been elected to these august um, bodies. In particular, as a Brit, I'm incredibly honored still uh, to be a fellow of the Royal Society. So I wanted to think about that. This, I am amazed. I stand here amazed. I, I don't believe I could have really done this uh, in this time. And so how on earth uh, did this happen? So the first thing to realize is that I was lucky. I'm going to come back to my luck. There's all sorts of aspects of luck uh, that one has in life. Um, and some of these are luck that is sort of role of the genetic dice or role of where you were born in society of all sorts of different things. I also did sort of time things almost perfectly. I taught myself to program before it was really cool to be a biologist and programming. And then I went and did stuff at the Sanger Institute with the Human Genome Project. I was at the right time, at the right place. Now, to my credit, you, know, you can't really take credit for luck. I think the only thing you can take credit is seizing your luck and using it and using those opportunities. But actually, the other thing about this is that I am not really the person responsible for all of those 210 papers or those citations and everything else. I've always done this in a context of people around me. And it's very weird, scientifically, I think, to think about individuals. We're really, I don't think science works as individuals, despite the fact there's a lot of focus on individuals in all sorts of different areas. It really is teams of people in different configurations. And my other part of my luck very early on was the series of mentors I've had. This is sort of early. I'm picking out Adrian Craner at Cold Spring Harbor. This was before I went to university. I had the chance to work at Cold Spring Harbor for a year, what Brits would call a gap year. And Adrian Craner um, wrote two papers with me, one when I was a high school student. Now, thinking about that now, that's quite a risk, if you think about it, uh, uh, to be a supervisor and say, someone with sort of no qualifications, I'm going to co-author a, a paper with this person. Ian Campbell at Oxford, he's an NMR, a spectroscopist, and he let me be totally independent in my fourth year. Again, he could have turned around and said, no, 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 please do this project, do this. I said, I, I kind of want to fool around on computers. Will you let me do that? He said, that's fine. Richard has been a really long time collaborator. So he's my um, PhD supervisor and then my collaborator in Ensemble. And we still work together. We have coffee together. We have dinner about once every couple of months. He's a very, very now close friend of mine, uh, but also someone who gave me a lot of freedom uh, during my PhD. And then when I went to Embol EBI, Graham Cameron and Fotis Kafatos um, took a big risk on me to hire me uh, as a PI, actually a month before I had 
sat my viva for a PhD. And I remember my original contract came with this letter from Fretis Kafatos, who's the director general, basically said, I am now breaking a rule to recommend that you should be hard at Emble. And just to make it clear, if you don't submit your PhD in the next month, then you're immediately fired uh, from this job. Uh, so I had this sort of, uh, um, sort of uh, a lot of people who took a risk uh, about supporting um, my, uh, my future. And I've had other people who, as, as I've kind of grown up, um, there have been some really key people. And perhaps foremost among them is Janet Thornton, as uh, Eric mentioned. Now, I don't know how many of you know Janet. She's a, she comes from the structural biology community. And in bioinformatics, there are two kind of wellsprings uh, of science that lead to bioinformatics. And one is structural biology, and the other is genomics. So she comes kind of from the other side of bioinformatics. Mm -hmm. Janet is charming, lovely, looks like she wouldn't have had a fly, um, very nice, uh, but actually has this kind of inner um, uh, backbone of steel. She knows exactly where she wants to go. Um, and she can either be nice to you or she can be nasty to you as long as, uh, as, long as we go in the right direction. And in many ways, she has told me, taught me a lot about relaxing in, as you get older and you have more influence, in many ways you have to give more space to the people around you for them to grow as well. And so that business of stepping back um, as you go, as you have more influence, is a really interesting process. And Janet absolutely uh, showed me the way there. And two other senior people have had a very big influence on me. So one is Francis Collins. And Francis and I, Francis met me when I was a young kid and I was all crazy um, uh, uh, through the genome projects. And there was a point um, uh, in particular around the ENCODE project where Francis, again, I think, took a risk in saying that a computational biologist should try and cat herd the analysis of all these transcription, chromatin, and all these other things that I didn't really know that much about. Um, and he backed me then and through some rocky times um, uh, as uh, bits of this um, developed. And then the other one is Ian Matai, who's director general of EMBL, um, and is still uh, a great mentor to me now, um, and again had to support me when um, I was being promoted very young, uh, basically. But it's not just the people above me. I have a huge, and I'm, you know, every, all of those 210 papers were done with people. And I'm just very, very lucky about the peers I've had. And this is a list of some of them, and it's definitely nowhere near the full set. And they, these people come and go, I find. Um, uh, you, you sort of have a relationship sometimes with someone for four or five years, but sometimes they come back as well. And so, for example, uh, a great example there would be Jason, who I worked with when he was very young, when he was an undergraduate doing BioPearl, and now he's into fungi, and I uh, dabble a little bit in fungi with him. Um, they go from very big projects like the, the fact that the EBI directorship is shared between me and Rolf, and we are joint directors and have worked together incredibly closely over the last um, seven years. Um, my wife describes him as my work husband, which is probably <laughs> sums up the whole relationship uh, in one. Um, but there's a big uh, list of people, including, um, you know, more recently, two really gifted uh, clinician scientists who I now work very, very closely with, Nazneen Rahman um, and Stuart Cook. And I'll be talking about one of the projects with Stuart in a moment. And it's not only your peers. I've just been gifted with this huge set of wonderful students, postdocs, and other people I've worked with. And I really can't list them all. It's quite interesting, because sometimes there are very, very distinct people who you have done one particular thing with. And you know that if you weren't with that person, this thing would not have happened. And so a great example there is Daniel Zabino uh, with Velvet, for example. Um, but there's also sort of teams of people that make things happen. 
And I, it's going to be a theme to me again. There's a big list here at the start of Ensemble uh, of lots of different people. And we all had to pull incredibly hard to make things work. So let's have a look at this. This is an impressive CV, but it's, it's really not me. It is this big collective of people in which I've been allowed to be part of. And I know I get, in many ways, a disproportionate, I think, recognition for this. That's partly because I like talking. It's partly because I'm, I'm happy to engage with people, so I end up at the front rather than the back. Um, and there's a gift and a curse of that kind of process. Um, uh, but it, it's, it's sort of, there's something slightly crazy about focusing on the individual. I've been lucky enough to work with this big group of people in very complex ways to deliver an awful lot of thing, things. So that was my first thought, that Simon is, uh, science is a sort of human tribal experience. The other thing about science is that it's open. And I, some people don't get this, and I, it confuses me all the time. I'm part of this wonderful society, the Royal Society. Now, very unfortunately, the French beat the Royal Society by three months on this, so this is always hurts the Brit in me. Um, but in the Renaissance, there was a really important moment, um, both in France and in England, and it was a shift of the transfer of knowledge being between master and apprentice between alchemists being secret, being something that was closed between small groups of people to something that was open and published and anybody could access, see, and assess. And uh, the motto of the Royal Society is nullius in verbia, which is basically on the word of no one. And it means without anybody's authority. I don't take other people's authority to decide what is true or not. And that comes down to show me your data, show me your argument, show me your data. I will make the decision about whether I believe you. And that process of moving away from authority and more towards objective truth got kind of um, codified in these two things, which are the first scientific publications. This one from France. Now, thankfully, there was the French Revolution, and so it's not been continuously published since uh, 1665. So the British can claim, the Royal Society can claim, the l oldest continuously published scientific journal, which is the uh, Philosophical Transactions. And I've always been open. I've been brought up open. I've been, I, I can't do it any other way. And I get confused when people don't do it this way. This is sort of this upbringing from molecular biology. Deposit in your data in gen, uh, ENA or GenBank. Deposit your structures in PDB. This is the rule of the game that I was brought up as a scientist to behave with. There's actually another theme to this. In the 1990s, if you're a computer programmer, this was the launch of the internet gave rise to the open source movement. Now, most of the internet is based on that. Most of the things we do, your, your Apple operating system, the core of all the bits and bobs that keep your email ticking over is all open source. We all use it all the time. So it's another theme of being open to this. And then genomics went a step further, what you might call aggressive openness, sometimes for conceptual reasons, but sometimes also for a very pragmatic reason, which is if you were going to concentrate an awful lot of money to a small number of labs, then you really wanted to see that being used by a large number of people. And that logic stands the test of time uh, today. And I get confused about people who, who do science in a closed way. Uh, there are some other science disciplines away from molecular biology which do that. I had an incredibly interesting discussion with an oceanographer. An oceanographer said, it is impossible to share data globally. I said, what do you, what do you mean it's impossible? And he said, you know, you know, all the cultural norms, all the credit or the ability to do this, how can you ever construct a system where you can share data globally? And I said, well, you know, in molecular biology, we have been doing it since 1972. So, you know, we're a case in point on the opposite side of this. 
So it is a sort of a choice by a group of scientists about what the rules of the game of openness are. But I believe quite strongly that it's kind of crazy to be in a closed world. And it's particularly crazy in the 21st century. And the reason why is that data generation has become so cheap that really holding things onto, holding data onto, on the belief that that's giving you an edge is a, is a misguided view. Your science is going to be driven much more by these three things at the bottom here. Asking good questions, designing good experiments or do good analysis approaches, and then executing good analysis. It's not going to be about can you generate the data, and crudely speaking, it's not going to be can you get access to the resource. So I think the successful labs in the future more and more are going to be the ones that understand not what data do I have, but what analysis can I do, and that's going to be the driving thing in the future. This comes on to the next point, which science is very much a team sport. We're all geeks. We're either dry geeks like me, or you're wet geeks, uh, lab people. Uh, we all like fiddling around, fooling about, doing things, understanding things by experiment and, and manipulation. But these days, you need all of these different pieces to come together um, uh, to do a successful piece of work in modern big data biology, if you like to put it. But I do, not even big data, pretty mediocre sized data. You still need all of these uh, things. Every lab very often needs all of these components. It goes from very kind of wet, geeky stuff, animal husbandry. I have a tremendous amount of respect for the people who know how to keep different species alive uh, in the lab in all sorts of weird and wonderful ways, um, all the way through to pretty hardcore bits of maths and statistical theory. And there are things in the middle which are really important, but nobody wants to do and can easily get forgotten about. So data cleaning would be the classic one. Someone has to do it. It's like the, the Aegean stables of uh, every analysis is you have to sort of sift through your data, decide which things you're going to discard, how, did they get their replicate structure right, which things to throw out and stuff like that. All the dirty stuff that you don't even show in your supplementary material because it's just too embarrassing uh, to even get to. Uh, but such is life. And there's a kind of view, some people have a view, that this should be done as a sort of contractual process. That, that obviously one lab can't do this, so the right way to do it is to sort of almost, almost like a, a shell company of a PI and one or two people who kind of contract out their husbandry to one place, their data generation to another place, their statistical analysis and databasing to another one, and it all comes together in that, that central shell company. And this really just doesn't work. And the reason why it doesn't work is because you're innovating and doing clever things all the way through. And even if you were trying to take a company-like view of this, a company would have a whole bunch of risk-sharing joint agreements about this and a lot of porous walls between all of these components. So instead, what I think you need is what I would call a sort of team science thing. This is trying to show um, areas of expertise of different people in a project. And the, the triangle is the center of this person and what they are good at doing. And the two little arrows I've put here is where they can ask sensible questions, OK? So this is actually a real example that I thought through. Hannah can ask sensible questions pretty much all the way to the edge of clinical samples. Antonio can ask some pretty good things about practical statistics and understand clinical stuff. Paolo is rooted in statistical theory and can just about ask sensible questions about pipelines and data cleaning, but then is at complete loss if you ask to, if you ask, put him in front of a clinician about where the data comes from. And the PIs here, in this case, there were two of us, myself and Stuart, and we have to stretch and be able to ask questions. We've got to be able to go from the left-hand side, question-wise, to the right-hand side. And I shouldn't have put us as, as, as um, diamonds, because, of course, we were absolutely hopeless 
If we, if we were put here, everything would go horribly wrong. But we pretend that we know uh, 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 centered at, at this point here uh, in these things. There should be some other shape for me and Stuart. So this is what you need to do. You will not get one Darman that will stretch the whole distance of this screen. It won't happen. You have to have components uh, and a team of people here to do this, and, and often a team of PIs to cover the whole thing. So I really want to give you this as an example now. So this is an example piece of high dimensional analysis. Going back to this, the two absolutely key people is Hannah and Antonio, Paolo and Katie. Katie was helping on the clinical end, Paolo's helping at the statistical end. And it's a collaboration with Stuart Cook, who's a cardiologist at the Royal Brompton, Declan O'Regan and Oliver Stegel, who is the statistician here. That's the statistics group. And this is a classic genotype to phenotype paradigm. And we've got all too good at going from genotype to phenotype. Open a, 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 a nature genetics program, you'll see many, many papers about disease level uh, GWAS. But of course, it's not the case that this variant here somehow directly makes you ill. It's not like the the SNP somehow makes your heart go wrong directly. It must go through some components. And these components, one can measure. So there are molecular components, and we've become really quite good at measuring these in the context of variation. So for example, when you measure RNA in the context of, of human variation or, or species variation, it's EQTLs. But you can also do that with ChIP-seq. Some people are doing it with HiC. That's interesting, but we wanted to move to a different level. It's not that these molecules themselves make people ill. They themselves must act through some other things. And so we wanted to go to organ-level phenotypes um, and to think about taking a, a phenotypic view of human organ and physiology. So basically, what, I, what we're doing here is an imaging genetics project. I will not bore you with the slightly sorry story of imaging genetics. It has finally got good with the Enigma Consortium and some of the neurogenetics. They are the best people at this. But there are some awful, awful, awful bits of paper which any geneticist will wince at where horrible candidate gene studies uh, were done in all sorts of different ways. And what no one has done is really had an un- supervised way of looking at these images. They've always, the successful ones have always taken a, I know this region of the whatever, and I know how to measure it. I know the hypothalamus. And so I'm going to now measure it, actually often sort of by hand. Uh, someone clicks on voxels around there. So we are going to do this in heart. 1,500 healthy volunteers. We get a high dimensional cardiac phenotype. We, we get genotypes. Uh, these days, the imputation is so good that you really, you, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's quite amazing. You really have to justify sequencing in a completely new way with imputation for research. Um, imputation is, is shockingly good now uh, uh, at this. And so, um, so for, for the people who are thinking about setting up a sequencing project, before you do that, think about um, uh, spending $50 on your genotyping array and hiring a really good bioinformatician to do the imputation. So this is um, uh, the phenotype measure we're using, and it's not, this is the old school way of measuring hearts with MRI scans, and my collaborators, um, in particular Declan and Reagan, are very proud of this new school way here. So the old school way would take, have multiple linear planes going through the heart, uh, very often done on more than one breath hold, giving a reconstruction this of the left ventricle here with this sort of resolution. The more recent one actually shifts the mag magnetic fields in a kind of twisting movement on a single breath hold. And you can see here far better resolution of the left ventricle. And just for you to know, the, the green area here is the myocardium, so the muscle wall, and the red area here is the blood filling up the left ventricle. And unsurprisingly, cardiologists are obsessed with the left ventricle because that's the business end of the heart. Uh, that's what's doing the pumping. So we're going to take all of these different um, cardiac uh, images. And of course, 
If we want to do this with the phenotyping measure, what you can't do is just assume that voxel 1, 1, 1 is the same on all people. So you can't just take images and, and sort of pretend that they're the same. You have to map them to some reference. And here, Antonio de Marvo was key in adapting what the neurologists use for image analysis of brains for the left ventricle, where you make an atlas of hearts. This here, the green here is the left ventricle muscle. The yellow is actually the right ventricle, which until I'm used to looking at this, it, it always looks kind of weirdly big, but it's kind of big and floppy, whereas the left ventricle is small and muscular and, and pumps through. So you make 30 of these pictures by hand, by manual labeling, and then you can automate the process of mapping other hearts into this idealized space. Now, it doesn't work all the time, and so Antonio gets a glass of wine, um, uh, looks at all the results, decides which ones aren't working, manually labels some more, runs it again, gets another glass of wine, takes about two, three weeks of quite concerted effort to get to a point where you've got a full set of things. So now we can get all the people on to uh, a the same coordinate system where we have 27,000 points around the left ventricle and at those 27,000 points, we can measure the thickness of this green line. For example, that's just one of many phenotypes. Now, before we do anything else, um, this is a kind of interesting business of experimental design. I sat down with Declan and um, uh, Stuart, and I said, well, what we've got to do is we've got to do the same person multiple times, but on very much different sessions. Because if we can't see inter-individual differences, there's absolutely no way we're going to see genetic differences. And uh, Declan said, are you sure? Do you know how scary, how annoying it is to go into an MRI machine uh, uh, eight times? And I said, you know, but I want this for my statistics. Uh, and so uh, uh, a very brave person called Declan O'Regan uh, <laughs> went into the MRI machine eight times over three months uh, so that we could get this kind of variance, and he's promised me that he never wants to go into an MRI machine ever again after all of that. And what we did get, though, is that we, this is the variance over the mean across the heart here, and the most important thing is most of this is yellow. There's a little bit of variance at the top here where maybe the model doesn't quite work, and there's a tiny bit of variance at the bottom again where it doesn't work so well. But in general, we get a very low amount of variance between of an individual between different sessions. And then we could also take these 27,000 dimensions and do the world's dumbest piece of statistics from 1970, which is do principal components. And if you take the first principal component of this measurement and you look across all these people, it correlates with weight. And this makes cardiologists happy. It's one of the most well understood things. Bigger people have more blood. More blood means the left ventricle is thicker. It's an incredibly well-established thing. So this got a big tick uh, on this. So we're now confident that this measurement is a good measurement. But we have a problem. So if we go even to this smaller coordinate space of 27,000 coordinates, and this is, roughly speaking, the, the number of SNPs that we would test, we would be doing this number of statistical tests. That means that either we have to make, have about a 10,000 or 20,000 person cohort, which we don't have, or we have to make epic assumptions about the effect size of genetic variants for this, so epic that one would expect that one didn't need a statistician to see that there were different people wandering around with different thickness of hearts. So we were sort of stumped. Well, we knew that this wasn't going to work out. So what do we need to do? We needed to create a smaller dimensional space that we could be confident was capturing what was going on in the heart. And here, Hannah tried all sorts of different things, but we actually settled on uh, something from Oliver Stegel's group, who thankfully works at EBI, where, uh, called PEER, which is a latent factor modeling system with a very strong Bayesian flavor. Now, uh, if that sounds pretty cool and sexy, um, that's fine. You too can say these words. 
uh, uh, if you want to, uh, uh, and draw this diagram. I don't actually know how the Bayesian magic works. Uh, in there, I just know that it works. Okay. But let me just tell you how PEER is set up. You have a phenotype here. This is 1,500 people by 27,000 dimensions. And you say that this is broken up into known factors like weight or sex and age, hidden factors, and then residuals. Now, PEER has been around for a long time and is used a lot in EQTL studies. And in EQTL studies, you hope that the hidden factors are missing batch problems or weird things going on in your lab. And the residuals, you hope, is your cleaned up signal. But we actually wanted to use it in the opposite way, where we wanted the signal, the genetic signal, to go into these hidden factors and nothing to go into the residuals. This is it pictorially. So one nice thing about uh, PEER, well, one night, sorry, when we ran this, gave us a lot of reassurance. So PEER doesn't know anything about the three-dimensional shape of this heart. Um, and what I'm plotting here are the first four PEER factors. And you can see it's kind of the red and blue are meant to be the opposite sides of a, a sort of variational mode. So in other words, in this picture here, some people have thicker hearts on this side of the heart, or the, this side of the ventricle, and thinner on this side, and other people are the other way around. They're thicker here and thinner here. So these are sort of variational modes of the heart that we're seeing across these 1,500 people. Peer knows nothing of the three-dimensional space. The red and the blue could be adjacent to each other in terms of the mathematics. But when we plot them, they're not. They're forming these nice shapes on the heart, and so that was reassuring. So now we can feel like we've got a smaller dimensional space, and so we then put this into what's now the kind of modern way of doing GWAS with this uh, uh, mixed model, the better model of noise, and a kinship matrix. And when Hannah first did this plot, I was like, we are in business, Hannah. This is great. So this is a Manhattan plot. If you pick up your nature, copy of Nature Genetics, you will see this on many, many uh, pages. Um, the x-axis is the position of the SNP, and the y-axis is minus log 10 of the p-value. And sort of statistical law mythology and Peter Donnelly has, has divined that 5 times 10 to the minus 8 is a good genome-wide significance level that captures the multiple testing that's going on. Do not really ask anybody to justify that number, but we're all super comfortable uh, uh, with uh, five times 10 to the minus eight. But we, of course, did 100 different, we did 100 factors and tested 100 different dimensions. So we needed to penalize ourselves by another factor of 100. And so it was these points here coming up above five times 10 to the minus 10, uh, which made me just very, very happy. My belief is this is the first time that an unsupervised approach on imaging genetics has worked. I don't believe anybody else has done this. And that is all credit to Hannah and Antonio. So let me just pick up one of those um, SNPs, this, this one SNP here. Again, for the statistical geneticists in the room, you'll be seeing this very nice QQ plot. Um, uh, you, you should always plot your QQ plots. And uh, uh, the QQ plot plots the expected distribution of p-values on one axis and the observed on the other. You want them to be fitting the x equals y line at the start. That means the test is well behaved. And then you want a nice healthy kick at the end. That means there's interesting stuff. And so this is a good QQ plot. There are other QQ plots which are bad QQ plots. And they go straight up at the start. And, and we don't show them uh, in general. <laughs> so this is the modal sort of shape for this snip here. So it's thicker or thinner here. And I first asked Hannah to do a very simple thing, which was actually to forget about the complicated statistics. And remember, this is a SNP in only two states. So um, uh, we're, we're only three values. You're homozygous, heterozygous, homozygous. Um, and we have one measurement, wall thickness. So we can fit an incredibly simple linear model, an intercept, a beta value, a slope on the SNP, that's the SNP X, and then an error. 
And this is just plotting now the R squared of this linear model across all 27,000 dimensions, um, signed and multiplied by the sine of the beta so that we can get both thick and, thick and thin if the SNP is going in two directions. And this is with no correction, no age correction, no sex correction, no height correction, no weight correction, nothing. Absolutely raw data. So at this point, I was very, very happy. There wasn't some sort of weird statistical mirage that led us into this. And then, because of the way peer works, we could break that signal down into the original single factor that led us to the SNP. This shape is basically identical to this shape. All the other 99 factors sum together, and then the residuals. And the really nice thing is there's no signal in the residuals. In other words, Peer has put all of that genetic signal into these hidden factors. But notice that this shape, which is the raw correlation, is not, is obviously has a big overlap here to here, but the, it doesn't have the same shape at the top. And indeed, when you look at this, it's almost as if there's something else which is counterbalancing this factor is that red bit's kind of removing that blue bit, giving you the sum over here. That says that this dimensionality reduction is not quite perfect, or is not perfect, it's not bang on the biology. And Hannah is now doing maths which is beyond my ability to understand, uh, to work out how to improve that dimensionality projection. So by shifting around the dimensionality to get this to be more sensitive in discovering bits of biology. Now, actually, this isn't, isn't my favorite locus. I got slightly the wrong locus. Um, I'll move on to the right locus. But we do have nice, you know, we, they lie under genes. They're quite nice. Uh, there are snip hits. And we had that moment. I was, we were talking with Stuart. Stuart's actually kind of one foot is in Singapore and another foot is in London, which makes talking to Stuart interesting. Um, uh, so we were on the phone discussing this, and I was saying, you know, you know, the real thing we should be doing, you know, can we, you know, persuade someone to do a mouse knockout? Oh, how exhausting this is going to be. Which, which locus should we do? What about this? What about that? And then we were reading around uh, the different areas, and thankfully, oh, I don't have the actual, uh, someone, <laughs> someone in Wisconsin had done the experiment we wanted to do in 2011. And so this is a, a picture from uh, her paper uh, of a JARAD2 knockout in mouse. JARAD2 is a um, histone modification enzyme. And indeed, in a conditional knockout specific to the heart, they see a very specific heart phenotype. And the interesting thing of that heart phenotype in this mouse knockout is we could then look at a similar phenotype in humans. And there is this non-compacted layer of the heart. I've learned an awful lot of heart morphology over the last two years. Um, so uh, this here is the um, right ventricle. This is the left ventricle, which is thicker. And at the surface of the heart, you can't expose the blood directly to the muscle wall. There'd be a lot of hydrostatic, a lot of shearing force going through onto the muscle. The way the biology handles that is there's a kind of soft, spongier layer of tissue that holds some blood liquid close to the wall and produces a much smoother surface for the blood to be pressed against. And that spongier area is called the non-compacted layer, and it's picked out here by these blue arrows. These are the homozygous minors for this case, and perhaps you can convince yourself that these are thicker than these which are uh, matched majors, a match for age and sex to these minors. You can do that by eye, but we can also do that with a piece of statistics uh, after doing the measurement, and we're working up other phenotype measures for this, but this is already very clear cut that this will work out. So here, we've gone from MRI scans through to GWAS, we were very lucky that one of our GWAS hits already had a mouse model with a knockout and a phenotype. We looked at the phenotype that they had studied, brought that phenotype back to our human data set, and then showed that that phenotype, a different phenotype from what we measured in the GWAS, 
was also significant. And I'm personally, I think I'm, this is ticked now. This has a big fat tick that says that this is correct. But this was team science. I couldn't have done this on my own. Stuart couldn't have done this on his own. Hannah couldn't have done this just in my lab. Antonio couldn't have done it just in Stuart's lab. It required an awful lot of people. Um, uh, so this is a picture of Hannah. I don't have one of Antonio. Um, it required all sorts of webs of people around to do this. It was also embedded inside of the, um, believe you me, cardiologists do not like healthy people going into MRI scans. MRI scanners are for diseased people. And so you have to have quite a long, extensive conversation with a bunch of cardiologists to even persuade them that 1,500 healthy people going into an MRI scanner uh, is a good idea. Um, and so that is uh, Declan and Stuart. And we actually, we used one MRI scanner for about a year and a half. That was the amount of scanning time needed to generate uh, this data set. So that's about science sort of at a small scale requiring teams. But at an even bigger scale, we need more than teams, we need infrastructure. We, I think, uh, life science is the last science to go through this. Pretty much all the other sciences, high energy physics, astronomy, oceanography, climate, all these other things have realized that one has to build on top of an infrastructure. And life science, we're taking these very slow steps towards this. Now, I used infrastructure all the time coming here. Um, yesterday, I used this infrastructure. I've been using that infrastructure, the internet. I used Amtrak. It's a great piece of infrastructure uh, 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 to get from uh, New York uh, to DC um, this morning. And uh, I'm using infrastructures like electricity here today. I did not say to Chris, could you just double check on the Washington DC power generators uh, for today that there's going to be electricity on the NIH campus? Because you know, if, if, you know, if Washington DC isn't gonna have electricity, my talk's not gonna work, I'll stay in New York and have a much nicer time. Oh. I made uh, an assumption that there's gonna be electricity. Chris did, you all did here. Nobody worried about whether there's electricity or not. These are infrastructures, and infrastructures, you only really notice them when they fail. So this is Heathrow in the snow. Um, it, it is a poorly designed infrastructure for the snow. If anybody knows Heathrow, there's a very small dusting of snow, creates this ridiculous two-week scheduling disaster uh, uh, after a small dusting of snow. I'll contrast that to Helsinki Airport, uh, which will keep open all the way through the Finnish winter. Um, uh, all sorts of things can go wrong, but we only really notice them when they go wrong. And in biology, we need infrastructures. And this is one infrastructure, the storage of DNA sequence over time. Um, it's not very exciting. I don't think anybody says to themselves, you know, my gosh, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a Nobel Prize for storing an awful lot of DNA sequence. <laughs> that is not the motivation for this team. They are not gonna get papers in nature. They are not going to get plaudits. But the team that does this and delivers this does it knowing that they enable a huge amount of science uh, uh, beyond this. And in Europe, we have started to build a data infrastructure for the life science uh, data uh, through this system called Elixir. And in many ways, this is building out from the EBI. We at the EBI realize that we will not scale over the next decade. In fact, that's not a technical problem, it's a social problem and scientific problem. We will not be able to get all the scientists we need cited at the EBI to deliver the infrastructure for the future. And I know NIH is going through the same thing with big data to knowledge, and then in the future, and I think it's just really important that as life scientists, we understand the importance of these infrastructures. It's kind of interesting running infrastructures because you tickle a different part of government. Um, and we had to write a, a report on the value and impact of, our, of the EBI um, and do it with an, a very hard-nosed piece of um, economics. Very simple, 
is this value for, is this infrastructure value for money? It's really, really, a really straightforward question in many ways. Now, sometimes it's very easy. You can, you can assess this very easily for some things, but many things, actually, it's quite interesting learning how you assess infrastructure. For many bits of infrastructure, the benefits are very distributed. So the costs you can, you can count, but the benefits go in a distributed way out. That includes all sorts of things like um, transport links and everything else, so spillover benefits and stuff like that. And so at the EBI, we commissioned this report that was run independently by this uh, economist Begri uh, group. And uh, actually, we had to persuade them. So these are conservative numbers. Um, they didn't believe the first set of numbers. And we were like, no, 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 no. You know, there really are that many life science researchers around the world. And uh, you know, let's make the assumption that we just save one hour every week. And they're like, well, but that number's big. And I'm like, well, that's, that's the way it works out, isn't it? So our conservative efficiency is that we have an impact of one to five billion pounds per year. We've got a 20-fold higher, uh, it's 20-fold rate than our operating costs. Now, the UK government feels an infrastructure is worth money when it's 1.5x, right? Just to give a sense of that 20-fold. This is, this is like a, you, you know, you've won me at this argument uh, stage. And uh, a remarkable way of achieving efficiency um, around um, the life science community. Now, I have to admit, this is a worldwide number. We have to produce a UK-centric number, because we get quite a lot of our money from the UK. Um, but even when we do that, we're, we're, we're good value for money just for the UK. Uh, 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 but we're doing this um, across the planet. Now, I want to return. This is my final set of slides. I want to return to that first thing about luck. And some people might have noticed those two things that I put in at the top. I am a rather boring Caucasian. I have been 23 to Mead, and I was hoping for some exciting piece of genomic ancestry. But I'm pretty much bang slap in the middle of France and England in terms of my ancestry. I have a touch, very small touch of South Asian ancestry. And obviously, I think some of you have genotyped me visually, uh, and you are correct, I am XY. Uh, 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 yes. And there is something wrong still, I think. I mean, as a society, both here and in the UK, we are still feeling our way forwards about not having this as luck, just as the same thing as hair color, the same thing as randomness, not being an attribute that I should list here under the things that I'm lucky about is I'm an XY genotype and most of my ancestry is European. And I think it is really unfortunate the amount of talent we are wasting. We're wasting talent on the XX genotype. Um, uh, the, we, are, we are level pegging on XX genotypes up to postdocs. And then something very radical happens uh, just when you look at the bulk statistics. Something goes wrong about that. Um, the, um, the, uh, this is UK data um, about uh, different ethnic groups. It's, it's always interesting, actually, when you're a geneticist now, you start distrusting people's self-reported ethnicity. But obviously, the people here, I mean, they, they as, a, as a way of describing genomic ancestry, but the ethnicity that people feel they have is obviously something that's just personal to them. And the really interesting thing that's phenomenal that happens in the UK, and I think it might well happen over here as well, is that there's actually quite a lot of people from non-white ethnic groups going into science subjects, but they're not becoming scientists. They're becoming medics uh, uh, in general. They're becoming medics, uh, sometimes lawyers uh, as well. And I don't think that's a bad thing at all. I just think that uh, there's a lot of talent, not that medicine doesn't need talent, it needs a lot of talent, I'm sure, but there's talent that we're missing attracting into science there as well. And there is a particular problem at the leadership level. Now, this I've described for me as luck, but I'm now in the position where I am, and I've got to be part of the solution and help set up the solution for the future. 
And actually, the easiest thing is diagnosing this. The easiest thing is talking about it. The harder thing, the far harder thing, is setting up structures that will actually change the way we support women, support people with different ethnic, different roots into science, different ethnic diversity, uh, uh, to really fulfill the same kind of potential that I've clearly had the opportunity uh, to have. And I don't think it's easy. I don't think it's, I think it will take time. It requires, I think, myself, a very data-driven approach. You, you have to be careful about the data and think about this. But it's something that I hope lots of people can work together on, in particular the people in higher parts of organizations, to change how uh, we do this. So with that, I'd like to end. And I'd like to thank, like I said, I am just one person in this big tribal process of making science. This is a big part of the tribe uh, that I am part of, Emble EBI. There are 600 people there. And thank you very much uh, for listening. Thank you, you and people. If they would come to microphones, we can certainly uh, have, we have time for questions. Um, I will start. So you and I, I really uh, appreciate it and, and like the, uh, I guess the, the triangle, not the triangles, the diamonds with the yeah. extensions. So, and, and maybe this almost relates to your last topic, but what, what do you tell young trainees um, who, you know, at one point may resonate with being one of those diamonds and sort of seeing their place in that progression, but also immediately recognizing that to be successful um, scientifically, they need to be part of that team to yeah. reach out to others. And yet so many of the um, traditional Assessment. modes by which we assess people's success um, goes against the team science approach. So, I mean, what, what's the advice you give? I mean, you talked to some of our trainees earlier today. I'm sure this might have come up. How do we reconcile yeah, the team I, science I, reality yeah. with the, the incentives to get recognized, be promoted, get grants, get papers, et cetera? Yeah. So I, I, I think we've got to get, I mean, I think the problem, I think it is an interesting problem. It's actually not a problem, I, I, I hate to say it, you know, bioinformaticians are just in demand. So what I actually say to my trainees is, don't worry, you've got a job uh, when you finish, no matter what, as long as you're not stupid. Um, uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, so, so for bioinformaticians and computational biologists, we're, there's so much in demand that that, that problem of, shaping your career is much more, I think, one of personal choice about where you want your diamond to be. And I spend a lot of time encouraging students, I think in a PhD in particular, that is the time where you can sh play around with where your center is and explore the different places. And I think that's very, very good for people to do that. But I do think we have a problem in assessment. I do think we have a problem in assessment. I notice it. Um, uh, it's, it, there's a sort of very interesting dynamic, very, very often on papers where, where there are joint papers, there's an agreement that the experimentalist goes first and the computational other author goes second as joint first author. I'm totally comfortable with that because the computational biologist is definitely going to get a job. I mean, I'm, I'm really sure of it. Uh, the, uh, the experimentalist is in this slightly more aggressive, you know, there's not enough experimental slots, really, uh, uh, thing. And I don't think we assess th things right, um, but I, th the thing that I think has been a good shift is this idea of doing research and research, meta-research, and actually thinking about these problems in a data-driven way. I think we do a lot too much gut feel of, oh, well, this is how I think now, and when I'm doing this, you know, we need, we need actual experiments to drive uh, these things. It's just the same thing that happened to sport. People did a lot of this gut feel when you were managing. You know, people don't, professional sports are not managed by gut feel anymore. Sure. Uh, they're, they're managed with a very strong stats kind of basis around teams. So it's not like we can't do this. We've just got to, re we've got to put it in the middle. So, but, but let me just press you on the one issue though. It, 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 it's, it's one thing to get a job, which yeah. like you buy and always can, but in particular you showed some data to talk about I think gender fall yeah, yeah, off yeah, yeah. with respect to leadership. Getting a job is one thing, but progressing, promote, being promoted, taking leadership roles, that's compromised if people aren't being recognized, but how do you reconcile being that's recognized while being in a team, team environment? Yeah, so I think that is true. But again, I think the, 
I think the drop-off, I'm not sure that the drop-off in, in the way in XX genotypes in women is it's, it's all about the fact that women like to be team players and men are, are kind of get out there. I think there's a slightly more complicated thing. The thing that I am very keen to do is try to create an environment both in my own research team and in my in the broader um, uh, in in EBI to let people have space and encourage them to step into that space, where so that they can get comfortable before they have to get comfortable kind of acting up before they have to act up in front of lots of other people, mm. uh, and and I mean I guess I think that's normal mentorship at some level, but really trying to concentrate doing that for everybody uh, in the lab and everybody in the, uh, in in the, the institute, yeah. yeah. Right. But I would love more data on this. I, I just don't think we have enough data on it. Yeah. Hi, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Uh, my question is, relates to the uh, aspect that you touched about needing infrastructure for biomedical science mm -hmm. as it compares to other fields, yeah. for example, high energy physics or uh, oceanography, um, oceanography yeah. outside. Yeah. So the question that I have is compared to those fields where they have data level concept levels of data from the time, let's say for example, a satellite data that they mm -hmm. receive and they go to multiple levels of processing before that data is converted to or yep. construed as knowledge which is yep. scales very small compared. Do you see that kind of approach working for yeah. also biomedical science and if so could you Give yeah. some insight so, so to it. I think, I think that's, I mean, actually, we, so we spend a lot of time chatting to our colleagues in CERN. CERN is a sort of, we are, let me put it, we're, we're kind of the poor sister of CERN in a European treaty. You know, CERN is a big daddy science European organization. Uh, and we are set up in a similar way, but with a molecular biology focus. But we, we're quite close with the guys who do stuff in CERN. And in fact, there are more parallels than you think about the way we currently process data, in particular things like cancer genomics data, uh, with the way CERN does it. And a very similar mindset when you get down to the guts of it. I think there is something slightly different about biology that is heterogeneous, but actually physics is a lot more heterogeneous than you think it is. Uh, when you start talking to physicists, it's, it's a bit more interesting. Um, so I think we've got lots, to, lots more to learn than to make big plays with the difference. One difference that really is there, though, is that in high energy physics, you have a very small number of data generation sites. In, molecular bio, in life science, you have thousands, thousands of data generation sites. And that is very different. That's very clearly very different. And we have to have a slightly different infrastructure in bringing data sets together. But I wouldn't be too negative about that. We actually, as a community, have a good track record of this. The thing that I want to make sure we internalize is that we have to make the justification for these infrastructures, and we have to understand how those infrastructures are run and delivered for, for us. Otherwise, our science is just not going to progress. And for me, it's not an option. These infrastructures must exist. Thank I'll you. Take one last question over here. Uh, hi, Ewan. Thanks mm. for giving what was very personal talk um, and, and a human element to it, because that's not what we're encouraged to yeah. do a lot of the time as, as scientists, so it's very refreshing. But building on your... But, that, that worries me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm worried now. <laughs> well, you shouldn't be. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you, you started with the theme of science is human, yeah. and, uh, and what flows from that in a way is scientists are humans. Yeah. And... Uh, yeah, Medawar and even John Cleese have sort of developed the idea that actually being basically human is a, is oh, a lot of scientific is, characteristic yeah. to it. And I think this connects to your other two themes about team science and about openness. And I don't know, this is ending up phrasing the question rather provocatively, um, but it's the split in a way between the science and the humanities, which with the education yeah. I had to go to it, which is probably not that dissimilar from yours. I was you know, focused on biology, physics, and chemistry by the age of 16. What about the humanities? What should we, should we be teaching scientists to be humans, <laughs> to put it provocatively? <laughs> yes. So, uh, yeah, I think we should, we should accept that scientists are humans. We are humans. 
I, I, I wonder if we shouldn't do a quick GWAS of, you know, taking all the scientists together, comparing them to controls, and see if there's any traits that, uh, that come through. Uh, I, I, uh, I think that GWAS could be quite interesting. Um, uh, the one thing I would say, I've, you know, this makes me, I'm an old man, I have gray hair. And I have come to... Where? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I don't see it. Um, but I have come to really like um, encouraging my students. Leland is here, and he had this uh, recommendation a couple of months ago um, of uh, doing a history of science part to the introduction to their, to their thesis. And the reason why I think a history of science approach at the start of your thesis is good is it makes you see science where you kind of know the answer, but you have to really start thinking about why did these people do these experiments? Why did they think this way? Why was this a big issue in whenever it was that it, it came about? And actually, for me, that, so I think the history of science is under-taught by scientists. We should embrace our own history. And I think because, as you say, science is very human, when you take a historical approach to science, you understand actually a little better the processes around you now because they are not so dissimilar 50 years ago or, or 80 years ago, what have you. I recommend, I won't go into this, I recommend reading my blog about x-rays in medicine. Mm -hmm. So if, if, you, if you want to see about a new technology coming and changing medicine, maybe a bit like genomics, well, it's happened before. And that was x-rays coming into medicine. And I think we can learn a lot there from the history of medicine and about how x-rays were internalized into medicine, and that was from the 1890s, for example. And, and I've read that blog. It's excellent, and I would recommend it as well. Well, we're going to stop there. First of all, what a terrific way to end, because what you just said in your last one minute is exactly the reason why we're having this series here. It completely, I think, is very important to think about. And it's only a history from only 25 years ago in our field, but I think exactly in the same way thinking about other disciplines that have been around much longer, I think the history is completely lost on people because we don't appreciate it. We don't, actually don't even catalog it very well yeah. in many cases. So as expected, this was terrific. I just, everybody join me in thanking you.